really happy to talk about about wave mode um mostly because i've been involved with with this this type of imaging for a very long time actually it was was part of some of the first uh conceptual trials during my postdoc in academia uh, with this this kind of this kind of imaging and now at nanosurf have been part of the team helping to to make this a commercially available mode and, and uh, available to a, a wide number of users um, so let's get into it um, wave mode uh, in general uh, as, as we mentioned is um, more descriptively, a photothermal uh, off-resonance imaging, and what this means exactly, we can see in, as the session continues. Um, but what I want to start with is, is a bit of a question of general AFM imaging, and what's a, a good a good way to to image, or what's a good mode to to image if you just need to use AFM for for something in general. What should you you pick? You've got a few different imaging modes. Um, Things like static mode, dynamic mode that we've heard about already, and now wave mode. Um, this is admittedly my my biased interpretation of, of things, but what I see is um, some main some main things you might be concerned about are: is it easy to use? Is it is it robust? Can I can I use this in and and be sure that it's going to work uh, in a variety of different situations? Um, can I image gently? Is it going to to cause some some problems on my sample because of that, and do I have to spend a long time getting an image? Those are some things you might be concerned about. And what's great about wave mode is the answer to all of those questions is really yes, and we can see that as we go through. Um, in comparison with some of the other modes, where for things like static mode, um, you have limitations like high lateral forces, or in dynamic mode where um, it's a bit hard to understand what's going on sometimes because of these, this interaction with the resonant object uh, and some artifacts can come up because of that. Um, with wave mode, uh, it solves many of these challenges. Um, so to understand that better, I want to go back uh, again to, to looking at how uh, NAFM works as well. I mean, this was presented earlier, this whole loop of, of the feedback cycle in the AFM so we have a cantilever that's interacting with the surface and a photo detector that's detecting that change in the interaction. The question is, how is that going on? What are we doing here? Um, the signal is coming into the controller and then the controller is trying to maintain some constant interaction uh, and sending out a, a control signal based on that. And again, the question is, how is it doing this? But look, look at some of these things in a bit more detail for these different imaging modes that we have available. Um, and, uh, just in terms of the plot that I'm going to show here, uh, just keep in mind, so on the vertical axis, uh, show deflection and on the horizontal axis, time. And so for static mode, um, we essentially we bend the cantilever to some predefined value, a, a, a constant, uh, constant deflection level and try and maintain that. So we have more or less in terms of frequency regime of operation, we have DC operation. So we have some, some constant level that is a constant a deflection signal is coming into the controller and the controller is trying to maintain that at a constant value. So this is sort of a, a DC mode of operation. Um, in dynamic mode, the cantilever is, is actually continuously uh, oscillating at around its resonance frequency. So our frequency of operation is, is around the resonance frequency of the cantilever. And what we're looking at is then a, an oscillating signal because our deflection is constantly oscillating coming into the controller and we're trying to maintain the amplitude of oscillation relative to some reference that we measured uh, so we can measure the amplitude relative to that in different phase. Um, off resonance modes uh, in a, a logical enough way are operating away from resonance so at some frequency that's that's less than the resonance and the difference between uh, dynamic modes and off resonance modes is, is that the, the operation here can be thought of, uh, and here we really have to think of the cantilever as a resonant object. And when we're away from the resonance, when we're far enough away from that, then we can think of the cantilever not as a, as a non-resonant object. So we have um, really two kinds of interactions with the cantilever uh, and the surface. We can have cases where the cantilever is, um, is actually not interacting with the surface and cases where it is interacting with the surface and these can change as a function of time and we'll see that the the type of signal that we get is looking something like this in comparison to 
a static case where the signal is constant at a at some deflection in a dynamic mode where it looks more like a sinusoid in off resonant modes we have some signal that's that's looking more like like this uh, so the question is how can we create a um, a situation where we have this cantilever sometimes interacting and sometimes not interacting with the surface um, Historically, that's been done by just moving the cantilever up and down, as is shown in this animation here. And then when we put the cantilever in contact with the surface, when the surface is there, then the cantilever starts to interact when it's at the lower point of this oscillation. Um, so here we have, again, this kind of situation where we have the cantilever not interacting and interacting with the surface. And so we have this sort of deflection signal that's coming in. Um, but what we have to keep in mind here is that to do this motion of the cantilever, um, we either have to, to move a significant object behind it, either the whole sample or uh, in the case here in our systems where we have a, a tip scanner, we would have to move the entire Z scanner that also has a cantilever holder and the cantilever mounted on that. And if I look at the mass ratio of the cantilever itself um, to this entire object behind it, that's about a, a uh, eight order of magnitude difference. So it's actually, it's, it's really huge. It's unbelievable how small the cantilever is compared to how much mass would have to be moved uh, to move the cantilever on top of the, the scanner. Um, and just for curiosity, I was wondering what else might have such a ratio of eight orders of magnitude and mass. And um, it's something like this. So in, in Switzerland, we have, we have lots of trains and lots of money. Um, and if you take a, a small coin and compare its mass to, to a locomotive like this, it's also about a, an eight order of magnitude ratio. And so the question is, if you have to move something like just the cantilever or uh, a coin, sorry, very quickly, what would you rather do? Would you rather just move the coin or put that coin onto a train and move the whole train? Uh, personally, I would rather just move the, the smallest object possible. And the question is, how can we reliably move just the smallest object possible? It's just the cantilever. How can we get to a situation where we have just the cantilever that's moving instead of everything else behind it? Um, and this is where photothermal excitation comes into it. I think we've touched on this topic before uh, in the, the previous sessions. And just to remind everyone of what photothermal excitation is, we have our normal readout laser uh, that's measuring the deflection of the cantilever, and we have a second light source that's typically shine, shine towards the base of the cantilever and modulated in intensity. And that is simply enough when more light impinges on the cantilever, the cantilever heats up uh, very locally and that causes a bending uh, effect of the cantilever due to the, the thermal bimorph effect of the difference in thermal expansion between the cantilever and uh, material and the coating. And what's great about this is it's really a, a a direct actuation of the cantilever. It's really only affecting the cantilever and not, not everything around it, or it doesn't need to move any other object than the cantilever. Uh, already in things like dynamic mode where we work at resident, resonance, it's a, a great benefit, especially in liquid. Um, there, as we can see here, um, if we try to excite a cantilever to, uh, using traditional piezo excitation, we get this, this well-known uh, jumble here that's called the forest of peaks, where because the uh, piezo is shaking not just the cantilever, but the fluid and the structures and everything around it, we have quite this mess and it's hard to interpret. Whereas if we actuate the cantilever with uh, photothermal actuation, uh, we're moving just the cantilever. And so we get the nice clean response as we would expect and can really see uh, the cantilever here. Um, Another great benefit of it is that it's very stable and insensitive towards environment changes. And to, to illustrate that, we, we did this, this little experiment here where we uh, put a cantilever into a, a droplet of liquid and excited the cantilever, uh, uh, the cantilever at a particular amplitude and allowed the droplet to evaporate. And you can see even though the droplet size is changing drastically from, from, not, from its ori original size down to, to nothing, the amplitude over that period stays very constant. It's only when the, the droplet actually evaporated and the cantilever went out of the liquid that the uh, conditions changed enough to, to really affect the, the oscillation here. 
And finally, what's really important in the case of wave mode from photothermal excitation is that it operates not just at the cantilever resonance like I've shown here, but also at other frequencies from DC, so from static values all the way up to resonance, even beyond resonance for multiple harmonics of the, of the cantilever. And that's easy to, to think about conceptually if you just understand. Um, as I, I shine light on this cantilever, if I if I do that at DC, the cantilever is going to heat up and it's going to bend because of that. So it would stay at some constant deflection. And then when I start to turn that light on and off, the cantilever will start to shake and I can do that faster and faster. Um, because of, of heat transfer effects, that uh, efficiency drops off as a function of frequency until you see the cantilever resonance uh, come up and, and start to get a, a Q enhancement from the resonance. But Nevertheless, we can still get quite appreciable amplitudes in the frequency ranges we'd like to operate with for off resonance imaging. And I'll show some examples of that. So, putting this all together, then, what is wave mode? Um, it's really this concept of off resonance imaging. So, imaging at a frequency that's uh, away from the cantilever resonance at a lower value. Uh, and moving the only, moving the, the smallest thing that we have here to do this, this kind of thing, moving just the cantilever by actuating the cantilever photothermally. Um, and what we see here in this animation is exactly that. We shine light on the cantilever, the cantilever bends down, interacts with the surface. And then uh, when we uh, change the intensity, the cantilever will retract from the surface. And so we get this kind of a, a deflection over time signal that looks like this. Um, and uh, we can use this in off resonance imaging. I just wanted to point out uh, this great paper that shows the first demonstration of the concept and uh, even some, some really pushing the, the, this concept to its limit by using ultra small cantilevers. We're going really, really at, at very high imaging rates. Um, so. I'd encourage you to take a look at that paper. It's really great. Um, what I'd like to do now is look a bit more closely into this deflection signal, what's going on here, and try and understand that a bit more uh, in terms of the, the way that this is operating. So here again, I have some traces that I've recorded. This is uh, deflection versus time. I have two signals here. I have a in the light blue, a free cantilever oscillation. Uh, and in dark blue, uh, a, a trace where the cantilever is interacting with the surface. Um, so really just to point out the signal is, in, is, is shown in volts, but of course you could calibrate this to nanometers if you had the deflection sensitivity if you, if you needed to do that. Um, and then there's two regimes here. One is where the tip is away from the surface. And uh, so in this case here, I have two oscillation cycles shown, and so there's two regions where the tip is away from the surface, shown in, in light gray here, and then regions where the tip is interacting with the surface, shown here. And how can we see that? Well, we have our free cantilever oscillation. So that's the motion that the cantilever would make in the absence of the surface. When the cantilever starts to interact with the surface, you can see here that the deflection is going down. That means the cantilever is getting uh, attracted towards the surface. So there's a snap in of the, the motion of the cantilever. So it's snapping in under the surface, and then we have the cantilever pressing against the surface. Um, then as the cantilever without the surface would want to pull away uh, or, or retract, uh, at some point the cantilever is going to snap off the surface as well. We can see in the overall shape of the, the signal we have uh, an amplitude of oscillation, and then we have, with the interaction, a, a truncated or reduced amplitude of, of the oscillation. <coughs> Excuse me. And that overall reduction in amplitude is something we can use uh, for imaging for feedback. So we can have as our set point of reduction in this amplitude. And then finally, what, what are some features I see here? Uh, after we snapped off the surface, the cantilever uh, has an energy of, of uh, being released from the surface and will ring at its resonance frequency. So the, the oscillation frequency here that I see is a cantilever resonance frequency. Uh, so for, for our controller, um, 
it handles these signals just just exactly like I've shown them here. Um, but for understanding what's going on, we can also display uh, the difference between the two signals just uh, in, in post-processing. And you can see here, uh, again, so this is shown as an interaction where I've taken the, the difference between these two signals, where I can see whether the cantilever is more or less deflected than it would be uh, in the absence of the surface. And then we start to see that the overall behavior of the cantilever is very similar to what I showed before. We have a region where the cantilever is really not interacting with the surface and then interacting again. So here it's sort of in its undeflected state or it's, it's uninteracting state and then it's this interaction. Um, and because we are not at resonance, we can also start to think of these curves as well in terms of more, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. I can again calculate the interaction force uh, from here, get an estimate. Uh, because the, the cantilever is, is not at resonance, we can think of the deflection of the cantilever as uh, translating fairly uh, directly into the, the force that it's interacting with on the surface. Um, and so we can also display this, uh, start to think about this as uh, this very force curve like uh, information. And instead of plotting this as uh, interaction versus time, we could plot this as interaction versus uh, free deflection. We start to see sort of a force curve like. Uh, appearance of the, the data. But for the imaging and for the topography feedback, we, we handle the data as such. So um, that's a bit of the, the inner workings of, of wave mode. And now I'd like to, to look a little bit about more um, what does it, what, what's the good things about it. Um, and as I mentioned before, one of the the really great thing is that it's it's robust and it's easy to use. And what do I mean by that? Um, first is that uh, compared with, uh, or in, in contrast to dynamic mode, um, there's no tuning of the cantilever that's needed. Um, we can choose a frequency uh, over quite a wide range of, of operation, and that frequency could be used. So here, for example, we can set for this particular type of cantilever, um, eight kilohertz is, is a good, value and uh, when I take a new cantilever out of the box I can I can keep that value without having to retune anything and um, that just makes fewer parameters that need to be thought about and, and adjusted. Um, in terms of the the drive AFM itself and the the way that a user might use the system um, what makes things quite easy to use is, is that we have automated alignment of the readout and photothermal light sources so that that also simplifies the process without having to think about how to align the the, the two light sources onto the cantilever. Um, you can just press a button and the system will do that for you. And finally, in terms of the uh, the, the way that the the imaging is performed, um, it compared with other modes, there's a lot fewer changes in the interaction regime. So what I mean by that is, for instance, in dynamic mode, um, as, as this image here shows, if the tip happens to pick up something, that changes the, the resonant behavior, the, res the, the resonance of the, the mode and can change the, the feedback settings. Um, so you can get things like this here. You have skips because uh, in, in the imaging. So this should be a nominally flat surface, but maybe the tip picked up a little Bit of something or changed slightly enough to to cause a bit of a jump in the way that the, the system interacts. This is quite a common thing that can happen in dynamic mode. In wave mode, this kind of thing doesn't happen um, because there's no resonance. If the tip picks up something, while well, you're still interacting with the same sort of general deflection uh, force. And comparison to static mode, then there's uh, in static mode, there's no correction for the DC drift of the signal. So if the, the non-interacting level is changing because of a system drift, we don't have that, that information because we're always in contact with the surface. Whereas in operating mode, we know that sometimes we're in contact and sometimes we're not. So we can use the portions where we're not in contact to correct for any kind of DC drift. Um, Another thing that's really great about wave mode is that it's uh, very gentle and uh, has low imaging forces. And these, these sets of images show that quite nicely. Um, on the left here, we have uh, 
two different samples. One is a, a DNA tripod assembly, and these kind of structures are all uh, very easily damaged or perturbed by imaging forces. And so we know that if we can see these structures and and, and uh, image them uh, without breaking them, that we're interacting quite strongly. And from that uh, that type of analysis that I showed before, we can say that we're probably interacting with about a 50 picanewton contact force on this, this surface. Similarly, here we have a, a, a protein ring, this SAS6 protein. Um, and here we can we can see also the subunits within the ring. And similarly, we can know that uh, we're imaging quite gently because these structures are very easily damaged or destroyed. And we think we're probably interacting with about 100 picanewtons of force. Um, and finally, because we're doing quite a, a large withdrawal from the surface at every ramp cycle where we, we go down, touch the surface and come back, um, we actually have very low lateral forces on our, on our sample. And as an example here, you can see these uh, HSV, uh, these viral capsids, um, these are very weakly adhered to the surface. And actually when we tried to image these in dynamic mode, they were just pushed around. But in wave mode, we get these beautiful images here. Uh, and as well, wave mode, uh, in addition to being fairly easy to use and robust, is, is also, uh, and gentle, is also fast. So this, this rate that we can photothermally actuate the cantilever up and down, uh, it reaches tens of kilohertz, uh, depending upon the type of cantilever used, which can translate into fast imaging line rates. And of course, all this always depends on the, the samples that you're trying to measure and the scan size. But as a few examples here, you can see this, this polymer blend. Here that we're uh, operating at 20 kilohertz ramp rate, so it's quite incredible to think that the cantilever is touching down under the surface uh, 20,000 times per second, and we can use that to to image the, the surface at about 10 hertz line rate. Uh, a little zoom in from is shown in the middle here. You can see we're getting a nice quality image even at these these comfortable line rates. And similarly, uh, the sample on the right that's shown, uh, Selgard has quite some sharp features. So it's, it's, it's generally known as a, a sample that can be challenging to image at high line rates. And here at even, even slightly higher ramp rates, 40 kilohertz, we're, we're able to achieve nice, comfortable line rates for imaging. Even with uh, these gentle, challenging samples, we can still image quite comfortably, uh, quite quickly. So here's a, an image of this, this DNA uh, hexagonal lattice, the, one of the final images I showed before, but here you can see the assembly process as, as a movie. And I see here we're imaging this with very gentle forces, but at comfortable line rates so we can follow this process along uh, as it goes. And again, the reason that this is possible is because of the, the choice that we've made to move not the whole scanner and the whole cantilever holder and everything behind it, but just the cantilever itself using photothermal actuation. So if I look at what would have been possible um, if we had chosen to move the scanner and everything, uh, then I, I, I can look at the dynamics of our scanner. And here I can see um, for the drive, uh, what's shown here is the, the general um, resonance frequency of the, of the scanner in Z. And that's around three and a half kilohertz, which is, is quite good for a, a scanner with 20 microns of Z range, but is a lot slower than the resonance frequencies of many cantilevers. And so if we were to operate the, the scanner to be able to move the scanner up and down controllably to do this off resonance motion, we'd be stuck at a, at a rate somewhere around here. Whereas the cantilever that we we're able to use for, for these images uh, has a resonance in water uh, that's, that's at about 20 kilohertz, 20 or 30 kilohertz. And that means that we can actuate the cantilever here about a factor of 10 faster. And because we can do this cyclic motion faster, we can send information to the controller about the, the topography feedback faster. And that means that we can image faster. So furthermore, just to to show some more examples uh, where wave mode is, is, is really a nice imaging mode to, to choose to, to do. Uh, the imaging is, is across a broad spectrum of samples. Here we have a, a sample of mammalian cells, so typically known for having very large topography um, and can be quite challenging to image because of that, because of their topography and adhesion. Um, and we can get this nice image here, this beautiful picture of 
showing AFM data in correlation with super resolution optical microscopy. Um, uh, but similarly, we can use wave mode to image uh, very high resolution structures like this bacteria redoption, redoption that we've imaged uh, in wave mode, and we can see the, the trimer of the, the protein crystal. Uh, and putting this all together as well, in the end, um, that means that wave mode lets you image uh, consistently, uh, quickly, and gently. And um, you can see that as well in this image of a, a, a set of images of this tip grading, or image the same structure uh, multiple times. And um, from image one to image 20, uh, we see no real change in the structure. And this is a, a, a sample that has very sharp features. It's known for really being quite uh, harsh on, on tips. And if you can't image, if you can't track the surface properly, then you see very quickly that your tip degrades. But here we can see that um, that we've done a good job of, of tracking the surface and maintaining uh, tip conditions. So what I'd like to do uh, in the last little bit is move to some, some practical questions that people might have about uh, wave mode, um, things like cantilevers to start with and, and other aspects of imaging parameters and things like that. Um, so the question that comes up, especially with thermal excitation and, and wave mode in particular, in this case, what cantilevers can I use? Um, and the, the short answer is almost anything. Um, the real uh, re requirement for, for wave mode is that you get reasonable efficiency in photothermal excitations that you have a coating along the length of the cantilever. And for uh, wave mode and off-resonant modes in general, uh, the, they're able to use softer cantilevers than for dynamic mode. Um, so just to give a few examples of, of cantilevers, um, I put them into three classes according to their spring constant. Um, this cantilevers that are stiffer here are would be very rarely used um, if you wanted to interact with the surface quite strongly with higher forces. Maybe you could take one of those, but in general, those are cantilevers that you wouldn't necessarily need to use for wave mode. Uh, the other two are, are, are much more the, the workhorses uh, of, of off-resident mode imaging cantilevers with a, a spring constant around one newton per meter. I would say are general purpose cantilevers that you, would, you could use for imaging in air. Uh, there's a few examples of those. And for imaging uh, very delicate samples, especially in liquid, then you'd want to take an even softer cantilever and there's some other cantilevers that would be possible to choose there. Um, what I should highlight are just these two cantilevers here. These are cantilevers that we have actually optimized specifically for wave mode and uh, offer or will offer very soon for uh, for use in, in this, this mode to our customers. Next, a question that comes up quite often is, so what kind of amplitude can I get to uh, with photothermal and in wave mode? Um, and the short answer here as well is, is that amplitudes above 100, nan uh, 100, newton, sorry, 100 nanometers uh, are possible uh, in both air and liquid um, if you really need that kind of an amplitude. But in most cases, uh, imaging with a few tens of, of nanometers is sufficient. 10, 20, 30 nanometers would be just fine for most samples that we've encountered. Um, but just to show that this really is possible, here's some, some data that I took of, of two different cantilevers, this wave mode 0.6 cantilever in air and uh, a bilevelar AC40 uh, in water. And here's uh, the dashed line shows this uh, 100 nanometer amplitude. You see for uh, on this log log clock here, we have uh, 10 kilohertz, 20 kilohertz, and so on. And at frequencies of operating here, the tens of kilohertz, we can still get to above 100 nanometer amplitudes. And for this cantilever here, we're operating at about 10 kilohertz because of its resonance frequency here. Um, we also can get to about 100 nanometer amplitudes. Um, as well, I touched on this a little bit that there's a wide range of frequencies that are possible to use. Uh, so the question is, in, in what, what frequencies can you use? Um, in air, I say the limit mostly depends on the cantilever resonance frequency. And as a general rule of thumb, something like a tenth of the resonance frequency is, is a good uh, a good limit to, to work with. Um, 
you can see that a bit what's going on uh, from these time traces that are that I've taken here, where we have in orange the the can't be uh, the deflection trace that is interacting with the surface, and in blue uh, the 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 trace that's that's not interacting with the surface. And a different frequency uh, of, of oscillation here at 10, 20, 50, 100, and at the resonance of the cantilever. And I would say the limit for operation is about here uh, at about 30, 30 kilohertz or so, which is, as I said, about a tenth of the resonance frequency. And the reason is that as we go faster and faster, we start to see more and more effect of the resonance of the cantilever. You can see this one, the snap off ringing is, is ringing at the resonance frequency of the cantilever, and it becomes uh, more and more part of the overall cycle uh, of the cantilever that we keep exciting this resonance and it's close enough to our operation that we can't think of the cantilever so much as a non-resonant object anymore beyond about that point. Um, but this still allows for quite fast operation in general. And in liquid it's a bit similar but uh, because of the low Q uh, you can operate closer to the resonance frequency and probably means that about a third of the resonance frequency is okay. So we're doing something similar actually with the same cantilever now in liquid. Um, you can see going 10, 20, 50, 80, and at the resonance of the cantilever. Here the behavior still looks quite similar to, qualitatively quite similar to what it is at lower frequencies. Whereas if you start to go beyond that, then it starts to change the way that the cantilever that is behaving as an object. So all of this together, uh, then how fast can I can I image uh, in wave mode? Um, with everything else being equal, that means uh, with the sample being equal, scanner, uh, amplifier, everything. Then what affects how fast you can image is really how fast can you get uh, that interaction signal into the controller and back out again. Um, and in wave mode, this happens once every ramp cycle. So every time we go down and touch the surface and come back up, we feed that information about was was the scanner too high or too low. Uh, during this process to the to the controller and the controller reacts based on that. Um, so that gives us an idea of how quick we could ultimately go. Um, so think about that. Um, uh, think about the pixel rate that an image might have. So if I have a 500 by 500 pixel image that I want to capture and I want to image that at one hertz line rate, that means that I'd have about one kilohertz of pixels that I'm trying to trying to capture. And that means that if I want to have at each pixel some information about the topography that's given by the controller, I would need at least a one kilohertz ramp rate to it to capture that image properly. So that means uh, if I think about that from the other side, what sort of ramp rates can we get to? Something like 30 kilohertz for or something like the wave mode can't be in air. Um, that means that our fastest possible line rates where we can reliably still control on the, the sample on the sample is about 30 hertz. But if you can really get that fast, that depends on your sample topography and scan size. In general, I'd say imaging with, with line rates from a few hertz up to 10, 20 hertz uh, depends on the sample, but that kind of, that kind of rate is uh, keepable. So then just to, to wrap things up, um, I started off by by claiming that wave mode was was all of these things, and I hope that through the presentation I showed, um, just based on how we set up the instrument and the the mode and the the behavior itself of the of the way that the cantilever interacts with the surface, uh, that it's both easy to use and robust. Um, that we can run uh, at low forces on on samples that really require critical uh, gentle imaging. And that because we can do this ramping so quickly that it's also a fast image mode, um, which uh, results in, in happy images and happy AFM users. So uh, with that, I'll just say thank you very much. And I think we can move on to any questions that have come up during the talk. <laughs>